In terms of inflation in our own businesses, it's extraordinary how much we've seen. You know, uh, the, I think you interviewed Herb Blumpkin at the Furniture Mart, and for two years, uh, you know, the prices have just kept coming in higher for these things, and with, and we sell them for higher prices, and people have more money than they've had before, and uh, uh, they like to buy. And there are certain things they can't buy. It's like during World War II, got a lot of money created, and people couldn't buy cars, and they couldn't buy refrigerators, and they could, couldn't even buy as much sugar or coffee or things as they wanted. They had little stamps and gasoline and all kinds of things. Well, eventually, you get a lot of money in people's hands, and you don't have very many goods. Prices go up. Now, you can do all kinds of things uh, to, uh, you know, try and talk it down. And of course, inflation is never the same. Nothing in economics is the same the second time after it happens than the first, because the first affects people's attitudes, and the second, and this, their attitudes always influence the 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 activity itself. I mean, it is it is an interesting. Phenomena. There are, there are people write a textbook and they write, write it based on the last experience, and people read the textbook so they behave differently next time, and they then they wonder why they get they're getting a different result than they got the time before. So anyway, we have we have sent out lots and lots and lots. When I say we, I mean the United States government. We have the government has sent out lots of money to people, and. At some point, you know, it, it, the money can't be worth as much as it was when there was less money out. Here's an I'm, here's an interesting figure that uh, I think probably will astound you. Sounds me anyway. The Federal Reserve every Thursday puts out a balance sheet. The, the Federal Reserve and Treasury they're complicated institutions, but they do put out this kind of consolidated statement of all the various Federal Reserve Banks, all these things that have entered into legislation over the years, and, and but there's a balance sheet. And 15 years ago, roughly, um, if you look, you know, the Federal Reserve issues those notes I talked about uh, a while back, and uh, that's the one, uh, there's the current one. <laughs> and they print these pieces of paper. And they, one way or another, they got it in the hands of people. Well, the interesting thing is, people said cash is dead and all that sort of thing, you know, cashless society. Well, there were 800 billion, go back 10 or 15 years, but there was about 800 billion of currency in circulation. And if you look at last Thursday's report, you'll see there's something like now $2.2 trillion of currency in circulation, 2.2 trillion. Now there's about, um, there's 300, well, there's 300, there's 100, and, there's 330 million people in the United States. So let's look at it that way. And with 330 million people, and you have, almost 2.3 trillion of currency in circulation. That's $7,000 per person. Every man, woman, and child, in theory, has $7,000 worth of currency. Well, you know, that isn't right, but you, but you do know that the Federal Reserve's bookkeeping is essentially right. They've got that much that's out there. I don't know whether where it is. I mean, I don't know whether it's in Russia. I don't know whether it's in South America. I don't know where. You know, I don't know whether Charlie's got it all. I mean, <laughs> it's it's a staggering sum. You know, cash is dead, and yet we, on average, have seven thousand dollars for every person in the United States. Now, uh, while you're absorbing that, think for a moment what would happen if the U.S. government said. Well, they work it out in private, and uh, they decide that they're going to send Federal Reserve, and 
I'm not going to blame the Federal Reserve for this. Somebody back in Washington is, <laughs> decides they're going to send out a million dollars to every household in the United States. And uh, there are 130 million households in the United States or something like that, you know, and, and the, they're going to mail you a million dollars in cash. And there were a couple of provisions attached to it. Um, one is, if you talked about it in the next 30 days, the money disappeared. So it was like in one of those old TV shows or something, and poof, disappears. And uh, after 30 days, uh, you could spend it. Well, all of a sudden, you've the household wealth of the United States, the Federal Reserve was on estimate. It's 130 trillion or something like that. So basically, you've doubled the household wealth. And all you've done is mail out people. But then you don't tell them you're doing it with everybody. You just say they won the lottery or whatever it may be. And now you've got an amount equal to household wealth. Uh, I was buying a much more risky asset at $600 an acre than the same farm was at 2,000 an acre. Now people, because farmland doesn't trade often and prices don't get recorded, you know, they would regard that as nonsense that, that my purchase at $600 an acre of the same farm that sold for 2,000 an acre a few years ago was riskier. But in stocks, because the prices jiggle around every minute and because it lets the people who teach finance use the mathematics they've learned, they have, in effect, they would explain this away a little more technically, but they have, effect, in effect, translated volatility into all kinds of uh, past volatility in terms of all kinds of measures of risk. And uh, it, it's nonsense. Risk comes from the nature of certain kinds of businesses. It can be risky to be in some businesses just by the simple economics of the type of business you're in. Uh, and and it comes from not knowing what you're doing, and you know that it it is if you understand the economics of the business in which you are and, uh, engaged, and you and you know the people with whom you're doing business, and you know the price you pay and run, is sensible, you don't run any real risk. And I don't think Charlie and I, uh, certainly Berkshire, I don't think we've ever had a permanent loss uh, in marketable securities that was, what, 1% maybe, half a percent? Isn't that worth? I made a terrible mistake in buying Dexter Shoe, which cost us a significantly more than 1% of net worth, where I bought an entire business then. But I was wrong about the business. Uh, had nothing to do with the volatility of shoe prices or leather or anything else. It just was wrong. Uh, but in terms of marketable securities, I, I, I cannot recall a case where we've lost that. I mean, we've done a lot of things in things in securities that had a very high beta. We've done a, thing, a lot of things in securities that had a low beta. It's just the whole development of the uh, volatility as a measure of risk. It's really occurred in my and it it's been very useful for people who wanted a career in teaching, but it is not, we've never found a way for it to be useful to us. Charlie? Well, it's been amazing that, that both corporate finance and investment management courses as taught in the major universities, we would argue it's at least 50% twaddle. And yet these people have very high IQs. One of the reasons we've been able to do pretty well is that we early recognized that very smart people do very dumb things, and we tried to figure out why. And we also wanted to know who so we could avoid them. And We will not run big risks at Berkshire. Now, we will be willing to lose, as I put in the annual report, $6 billion in a given uh, catastrophe, but our catastrophe business, run over many years, is not risky. 
you know, a... Now, business risk can arise in various ways. It can arise from the capital structure when somebody sticks a ton of debt into some business, and so that if there's a hiccup in the business, that the, that the, uh, that the lenders foreclose. It can come about just by the nature of the business. Certain businesses are just very risky. Uh, back in when there were more commercial aircraft manufacturers, you know, Charlie and I would think of making a commercial uh, airplane, a, a, a big airliner, sort of as a bet your company risk because you would shove hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars out into the pot before uh, you really had customers. And then if you had a problem with the plane, you know, the company could go. There's certain businesses that inherently, because of long lead times, because of heavy capital investment, that, that basically have a lot of risk. And commodity businesses have risk unless you're the low-cost producer because uh, uh, the low-cost producer can put you out of business. Our textile business was not the low-cost producer. And uh, we had a, a fine management and, and everybody worked hard. We had, we had uh, cooperative unions, all kinds of things. But we weren't the low-cost producer, so it was a risky business. The, the, the guy who could sell it cheaper than we could um, made it risky for us. So there's a lot of ways businesses can be risky. Uh, we tend to go into businesses that inherently are low risk and are capitalized in a way that that low risk of the business is transformed into a low risk for the enterprise. Uh, the risk beyond that is that even though you buy, identify such businesses that you, you pay too much uh, uh, for them. That risk is usually a risk of time rather than loss of principle. Uh, unless you get into a really extravagant situation. But uh, then the risk becomes the risk of you yourself. I mean, if, whether you can retain your belief in, 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 the, in the real fundamentals of the business and not get too concerned about the stock market. The stock market is there to serve you and not to instruct you. And that's, that's a key to owning a good business and getting rid of the risk that would otherwise exist in the market. You mentioned volatility. It doesn't make any difference to us whether the volatility of the stock market, you know, is, is that average is a half a percent a day or a quarter percent of a day or five percent a day. In fact, we'd make a lot more money if volatility was higher because it would create more mistakes in the market. So volatility is a huge plus uh, to the real investor. Uh, ben Graham used the example of Mr. Market, which is the, the, the we've used it. I've copied it in the report. I copy from all the good writers and Ben said, you know, just imagine that when you buy a stock that you, in effect, you bought into a business where you have this obliging partner who comes around every day and offers you a price at which you'll either buy or sell. And the price is identical. And no one ever gets that in a, in a private business where daily you get uh, a buy-sell offer by, by, a, by a party. But in the, in the stock market, you get it. That's a huge advantage. It's the, and it's a bigger advantage if this partner of yours is, is a heavy drinking, manic depressive. I mean, it, 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 you know, the, the crazier he is, the more money you're gonna make. So you should, as an investor, you love volatility. Not if you're on margin, but if you're an, if you're an investor, you aren't on margin. And if, if you're an investor, you, you, you love the idea of wild swings because it means more things are going to get mispriced. Actually, volatility in recent years has dampened from what it used to be. It looks bigger because people think in terms of Dow points and, 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 and uh, uh, so they see these big numbers about plus 50 or minus 50 or something. But volatility was, uh, was much higher many years ago than, than it is now. And uh, uh, you had the amplitude of the swings was, was really wild and, and that, that gave you more opportunity. Charlie? Well, it got to be the occasion in corporate finance departments of universities where they developed a notion of risk-adjusted returns. And my best advice to all of you would be to totally ignore this development. <clears throat> risk had a very good colloquial meaning, meaning a substantial chance that something would go horribly wrong. And the finance professors sort of got volatility mixed up with a lot of foolish mathematics. And, and, uh, to me, it's less rational than what we do. And I don't think we're going to change. <laughs> yeah, well, the finance department teaches that, 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 that volatility uh, 
equals risk. Now they want to they want to measure risk, and they don't know any other way. They don't know how to do it, basically. And so they uh, they say that volatility measures risk. And you know, they uh, I've, I've always often used the example that the Washington Post stock when we first bought it had gone in 1973 had gone down almost 50 percent uh, from a valuation of the whole company of close to uh, say 180 or 175 million down to maybe 80 million or 90 million. And because it happened very fast, the beta of the stock had actually increased. And a, a professor would have told you that the stock the company was more risky if you bought it for 80 million than if you bought it for 170 million, which is something that I've thought about ever since they told me that 25 years ago, and I still haven't figured it out. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just talking about the distribution of resources. We're, we're talking numbers like that, and and. It affects prices. It has to affect prices. You had ten times as much. You went home and you bought a you had ten times the net worth you had yesterday. But everybody else, the same thing. It had, doesn't increase the amount of bread in the economy or the number of cars. It it just means that the price, <laughs> the value of this is going to go down, and the, and uh, and and its purchasing power. You can't buy more than exists. So it's a very strange period where we had lots of money sent out to people one way or another we're getting it that, that uh, they didn't find as many places things to buy as before and we had supply chains but we have all these things happen but at the end of it is they go out to the Nebraska furniture mart and they start buying things and they do it with our other companies and they do it uh, in very peculiar ways and now they're buying, I mean, one thing, you know, jewelry stores were, generally speaking, not a very good business. And, and two years ago, uh, every landlord that had a, real, a jewelry store or multiple jewelry stores in their mall, you know, was wondering how they were going to get their rent. And uh, now every jewelry store virtually is, is doing incredibly better than they ever dreamt with way less inventory because people are just come in and buy. I mean, they don't wait for sales. You know, when they walk in the store, they're going to walk out and they're going to have bought something and uh, they pay for it. They got the money. So we are seeing an unleashing of the fact that we've just mailed a lot of money to people one way or another. It's very indirect. You know, well, it gets complicated when we talk about a big system, but this is what's happened. And uh, I will guarantee you that if we just, if we mail out a million dollars to every household in the United States tonight, and you don't know that it's happened, you, you know, you, you don't really expect much to happen in behavior tomorrow, but somehow, at some point, and then if you start doing it every month, we'll say, and people really know you're doing it, then they start anticipating and buying at a time and forward. I mean, there's a million things that happen in economics. But the, the answer is we've had a lot of inflation and it was almost impossible not to have. If you're going to mail out the kind of money we've mailed out. And it's probably a good thing we did it. In fact, I think there was one point when the Federal Reserve, uh, which in fact creates the money, uh, the they hadn't done it, your lives would be a lot worse, a whole lot worse now, and that was an important decision. And uh, uh, that's the way the, that's the, uh, that's why you've had inflation, and heaven knows, I mean, it could end, you can throw the country into recession, you can do all kinds of things. The country's going to have recessions, incidentally, and it's going to have depressions periodically. Things don't, things will happen differently. And you'll read a newspaper today and you'll wonder a year from now, why was I reading the newspaper a year ago? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's just the way it works. I, when I bought the first stock in 1942, did I know everything was going to happen afterwards? Of course not. I didn't know a damn thing. But uh, I just needed to have one idea. And that idea wasn't really well formed. It was just, it was just probably the way practically every kid felt about it. The country when we just gone into a war, you know. 
We thought America was going to win, and America was going to win then. It was going to win just generally, and, and savings bonds were paying 2.9%. I remember that. Because we, we bought them. They called them war bonds originally, and they called them defense bonds, and they called them savings bonds, but they were the same thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's, you, you print loads of money, and money is going to be worthless. Not worthless. I got in trouble doing that one time with CNBC because I said it was going to be worth separately less, but got contracted down to worthless. <laughs> so I, I it took me a few years to learn <laughs> to separate those words somehow. Uh, anyway, that's everything I know about economics and more, and Charlie can probably improve on it. <laughs> well, it, it happened on a scale this time we'd never seen before. Those checks that were just mailed out to everybody who claimed to have a business and claimed to have employees, they, they, they probably drowned the country in money for a while. And, they, and they, as you say, they probably had to do it. But it, it was something that had never been done on that scale before. But we had a problem we hadn't had before. Yes. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't a good no, idea. It, I mean, in my book, Jay Powell's a hero. I mean, it's very, very simple. I mean, he did what he had to do. You know, when, when uh, if he had done nothing, it would be the, I mean, he would be, uh, you know, be very easy to engage in what you would call thumb sucking. He had plenty of, I shouldn't say plenty of, but there are other Fed chairmen that would have been sucking their thumbs and the world would have fallen around them and nobody would have exactly blamed them. They would have blamed the the virus and the Chinese and all kinds of things. Well, the really interesting company is Japan, where they first they buy back all the debt, then they start buying back all the common stocks. Now, that's really weird. And what did they get? 25 years of stasis. Who would have pre predicted that? Well, nobody predicted anything. I mean, <laughs> there's nobody's predictions that we're interested in, including our own. I mean, it's very simple. The, what we do know, is that we can we can we can deserve your trust, uh, and there's no reason to do things that don't deserve it, and we can't tell what. But basically, we think we're trying to build a Berkshire that cannot can't withstand a nuclear exchange, but it can withstand just about withstand as much as that, anything that. That we can do anything about, and uh, and uh, that leaves us feeling good. It doesn't leave us feeling perfect. That we'd like to even promise you more than that, but we can't promise more than that. So it's, it's very simple. But, uh, yeah. Well, we had a case. We've inherited some option plans because companies we merged with had them, and and. Uh, some cases they got settled for cash at the time, some cases they continued on depending on the situation. But more money has been made from options at Berkshire by accident. And that, you know, this is not, it just happened that way, but more money was made by people that had options on General Re stock during a period when General Re contributed to a de decrease in value of Berkshire. So we had all of the other managers essentially uh, um, in, in a great many cases turning in fine results and we had a bad result at General Re and yet more money by a significant margin was made under options at General Re than has been made probably by all other entities combined. But it was an accident, but that's the point. It, it, leads, it can lead to extremely capricious uh, compensation arrangement, uh, compensation results that have no bearing on the performance of the people uh, in some cases get great benefits and other and in other cases people did great jobs and were their efforts were negated by results elsewhere so it's it, uh, it would be very capricious at Berkshire you can argue that at Berkshire uh, for those that succeed me and Charlie that anybody that is in the very top position at, at Berkshire has got the job of allocating resources for the whole place there could be a logically constructed option plan for that person and it would make some sense because they are responsible for what takes place overall. But a logically constructed plan 
would have a cost of capital built into it for every year. We don't pay on any dividends. So why should we get money from you free? We could put it in a savings account and it would grow in value without us doing anything. And a fixed price option over 10 years would accrue dramatic value to, to whoever is, was running the place if they had a large option uh, for putting the money in a savings account or in government bonds. So there has to be a cost of capital factor in to make options equitable in my view that there can be cases where they make sense. They should not be granted at below the intrinsic value of the company. I mean, the, the market, a CEO says, you know, my stock is ridiculously low when a merger, when somebody comes around and wants to buy the company, but then grants himself an option at a price that he's just gotten through saying is ridiculously low. That, that bothers me. So if somebody is, says, you know, I wouldn't, we don't want to sell this company for less than $30 this year because it's going to be worth a lot more later on. You know, my notion is that the option should be at thirty dollars, even if the stock is fifteen. Um, you know, otherwise you have a, an actually a premium built in, uh, for having a low stock price in relation to value. And uh, I've never gotten too excited about that. So, Charlie, do you have any further thoughts on options? Well, we've been we're so different from the rest of uh, corporate America on this subject that. You know, we can sound like a couple of Johnny One Notes, um, but I don't think we ever quite tire of the subject. <laughs> a lot is horribly wrong in corporate compensation in America, and the system of using stock options on the theory they really don't cost anything has contributed to a lot of gross excess, and that excess is not good for the country. Uh, you know, Aristotle said that systems work better when people look at the different outcomes and basically appraise them as fair. And when large percentages of people look at corporate compensation practices and think of them as unfair, uh, it's not good for the country. It will be 